Yeah. Uh, let's see what we got here. Okay, so are we ready to do some review? Okay. Um, so I'm not really going to, you know, I didn't bring any slides to project. So I thought what we'd do is we'd start at, at chapter one and start working our way through. Um, does anybody have an F extra copy? I should say lecture one. Does anybody have an extra copy of that thing? That's okay. So, well, I just don't want to do every single one if there's not anybody who. So let's just start on chapter on lecture one and see what we got. Okay. So what do we what, what kind of? Is that what it is? Where is that where we start? Yeah, lecture two. Yeah, lecture yeah, one was just intro. So you said like you want to go through like. I think it's a good place to start at the beginning and then work our way through. So I'm going to try to use most of this board because DC's not here and I'm recording this for her. So if I'm over there, I'll try to take the computer. If I don't do that, you're mine. Okay. So you're just, you're I think we should just ask questions. Yeah. So what do we mean when we say a mode of behavior is fully directed? And how is it adaptable? Okay. Um, <laughs> so this is this is sort of the this is uh you know some of these are going to be a little again a little abstract. So this is the the idea that. You know, humans are not machines, right? That a motor behavior is what, what we got here. It's it's goal directed. goal directed. So you do something like you're trying to reach for a monkey's trying to reach for a piece of fruit. There's a purpose for that. If it doesn't actually make it, it will keep trying to do that. Whereas a machine would just, you know, it, it doesn't get it. And that's it, right? And then the adaptability is that well, maybe it can't reach it with the right arm because the reach is not good. It will switch to the left arm, or it'll try to climb up and get it, or do different things. Yeah. So what does test, when we enter quantitative data, what do you mean for the data? Oh, definitely, yeah. Normal? Definitely, okay. yeah. Because that's a lot of these concepts, the best way to think about it is in some sort of context. Because especially for the first two lectures, the actual biology is either extremely complex or you don't know. I had some of the behavior lectures, but we have to go get That's true, yeah. So the, the whole idea of whether it's voluntary or not gets to the idea of there's certain like motor programs in some animals and it's kind of questionable whether it's voluntary or not. If it is it's just it, in other words, is it a dapple or is it just some like hardwired thing? Like um, certain mating behaviors where they have a pattern of movement and it doesn't change at all. So is that actually a voluntary movement because it starts? Okay. So there are certain animals that, like, you know, you, you show it a picture of something that looks vaguely female, and the male will do this complicated dance. Well, there's no, you know. Okay. So let me grab Abigail's got hers. This is fun. <laughs> All right, so feedback. Okay, so we talked about kind of several different types of models. Okay, we talked about feed forward. Feedback. Um, and the observer model. So I will not ask you guys to draw out one of these models. If I do something, I will basically, because you'll see there's more than one way to do it. Um, and if so if I ask you about one of the models, I would show you a picture and tell me what kind of model it is. So one of the things we, so one thing that's related to this, we talked about the idea of um, forward models and inverse models. And so for a forward model, you're basically saying, if I do all these activities, where will my in body position be, right? In other words, if I rotate this, I do this, I do that, move this way an inch, where will I end up? So we're moving forward in time. Inverse, I'm going to basically go backwards. I want to be here. What are all the motions that would put my hand here? And either one of these can deal with kinetic or kinetic. 
kinematic information or modeling. So when we say kin kinematic, it's basically just describing motion without reference to forces. Right? In other words, I rotate this so many angles, I wrote this in so many degrees, that so many degrees. Say nothing about the forces that are involved. With kinetic, or, or sometimes called dynamic, I'm, use, I'm describing motions in the terms of action. So this is important because if I say I'm going to twist my arm this direction with so many newtons of force, depending on how many newtons of force I do that, how much acceleration is involved, that would change the motion. Right. So one's purely descriptive, the other one actually starts thinking about the forces that are involved. And it turns out you use both those models in different ways. So those kind of things go into this. So let's talk about feed forward. So in feed forward, you are planning a motion that is often called open loop. Or ballistic something where you plan to do some sort of movement and there's no feedback that you're going to get immediately from that. So a good example of this is you know, trying to make a basket. There's no mechanical proprioceptive feedback that you get from that. The only thing you get is vision. And so what you're going to do is you're going to try to plan your movement as best as you can and then hope for the best. Um, so you're basically saying, if I do all this stuff, my hand should in here, the ball should end up out there. Right? And uh, you know, the, this is the kind of planning that does involve a lot of learning. Right? So you would get better at doing a basketball just by trial and error, um, seeing the success of your results, and then basically building a better forward model. That's how you do that. For the feedback, so basically here, if we think what's going on, we have a model. And we send down signals that lead to muscle activity. Okay? Feedback is a little more complicated. So sometimes it's called a closed loop. And here we have a model. We send out a signal to the muscle. We also send out a signal to some sort of comparator. And when the muscle moves, we also get sensory feedback. That also goes to comparator. Okay. Um, uh, what is it? Oh, closed loop? No, Observer? AP. The AP. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. AP. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, so it's some sort of signal, right? So you get a model, you send a signal to the muscle, you're sending a signal to some sort of comparative system, okay? And then you're also getting sensory feedback. So you've got an idea of what's going to happen that you're sending to, and you've got an idea of the sensory feedback. You compare those two, and then that informs your model. So in other words, if your arm is, you think you're going to move your arm a little bit, but it moves too much, you respond by, you know, changing the model a little bit directly or stopping how much force you're putting out to your arm. Okay. Um, so that's the feedback thing. Now those two things usually work together. Remember we talked about the idea that, um, you know, if I reach out and grab something, the first initial movement is feet forward, and as I reach out, then I start getting information from my body that I can use to make it more accurate. So all the time you're kind of combining these two sort of ideas. Um, if you look on the chart, there's a, there's a slide that I have where you have sort of a hand movement, and you'll notice that the hand movement starts out real fast, right, and then it slows down. The idea is that you're going out really quickly with the feed forward model, and then as you realize that you're on the right path or on the wrong path, you know, if you're on the wrong path, you're going to start adjusting. And that's the feedback portion. If I were to ask you to pick up a large object, what you'd find is your hand would move out really quickly, and then as you get close, it would slow down. Right? If I asked you to pick up something really small, you would actually start out slower. 
because you're not as confident about that P4 model. So you start out more slowly, and then eventually, once you kind of realize you're going, you would actually you know, pick it up. You're not aware of that's going on. But the more delicate the task, the more accuracy that's required, the more you're going to be hesitant to use the P forward, slow down, and wait till you get some feedback. Okay? So let's go over the, the does everybody feel somewhat confident about those two? So when you say learning for the P forward, mm -hmm. what do you mean by that? Because you're not getting feedback technically for the P forward, so do you mean like you're shooting a basketball and you missing to the right next time you shoot yeah. a basketball. Yeah, so you are getting feedback. It's just not automatic. It's not some sort of really quick sensory information. You're getting it way after. So, you know, if you think shoot a basketball, you know, a half second after it leaves your hands, you finally find out if it's going in or not. Whereas with the proprioceptive information, it's almost instantaneous, right? It's very fast. So you're making the adjustments on the fly. So that's what I mean. This, this kind of thing really have to go with learning. So if you watch kids do things, like they tend to do things a lot repetitively as they kind of build better models of stuff, right? So I was telling Abigail about like how often kids will just sit there and like pour water in something time after time after time after time, right? They're trying to get that kind of idea about how does motion work, right? When you're trying to not fill over the glass, the cause of glass to go over, okay? Um, observer model. This is the one that's uh, a little bit the most complicated. And basically what I want you to remember is that here, it's a model of sensory input. A sensory model. So they, these things work together, but this basically the idea is that um, I'm, I have some idea of what my action is going to be. And I know that um, if I do that 200 milliseconds from now, I should have my body in a certain position and I should get some sensory, feed, uh, some sensory feedback of that position. And what I'm going to do over time is figure out, well, is the stuff that's actually happening, the sensory information that's coming in, actually what happens? So I'm kind of predicting the sensory output of 200 milliseconds in the future. Now, what that means, though, is if I know what that's going to be and that model is accurate, I can assume that I'm going to be in that position 200 milliseconds and use that model to do the next motion. So um, I guess the best, so really just remember it's a sensor model. The, the, the best example of this is, like, like I said, like you try to tickle yourself. Basically what's going to happen is you make this motion. The sensory model says, well, as soon as I do that, you're going to get a, a tickling sensation. And you're going to say, well, I'm not going to tolerate that, so I'm just going to shut that off because I'm predicting there's going to be a tickling sensation. I don't want that, so I'm just going to not, I'm going to ignore that. Yes? I think it would be interesting to think about if you're thinking of the transition and you're anticipating a solo, mm -hmm. and you're thinking about the solo while you're trying to do Yes. Yeah, so it, it's a, exactly like that, right? You're thinking ahead, and you're assuming that, you know, if, you, if you're thinking ahead that solo, you're, not, you're, you're thinking about like, okay, here's the first thing I'm going to do, and then if that happens, here's the next thing I'm going to do. If that happens, here's the next thing I'm going to do. So that's an example of you mentally thinking about that, but that's actually going on in your brain as well, uh, you know, uh, all the time. Like, yeah, you are, there are parts that are planning ahead like that. Yeah. You're predicting the both, but this is all based on just purely motor sensation, right? This is basically predicting the outcome of motor stuff. This is actually predicting the outcome of what kind of sensory information you're getting. So there's, they're related. It's a, it's a subtle difference, but there's a slight difference. So just remember, you know, this is one that you're, you're kind of, the model is not just a motion. It's of actual sensor, sensory input. So does the forward and the inverse, does that apply to both P forward and feedback? Or is, does forward only apply to P forward and inverse apply to feedback? So um, feed forward is inverse, basically, a lot. It, actually, you can, it, it depends, right? The, pro the problem is that depending on the action, you, it turns out you, you do both, right? You actually can, you can do either system. So yes is the answer. So the inverse, I just want you to know the definition of forward and inverse. Exactly when it happens, it's not, not, not that important because it can happen in different movements you use forward or inverse planning. 
right? And again, a lot of this is theoretical, but the idea is if you understand some of these concepts, then you can design experiments to try to see what's happening in a particular medium. Okay. All right. Um, let's see, next question. Well, any, anything. Next lecture. I think that's actually the end of this lecture. Next lecture. Why is threshold so important? Okay, so what happens at threshold? And why are neurons and muscles completed so easily? Yeah. Um, so, what's the, so this is basically the, the, the basic neuron review stuff, right? What happens at threshold? We fire an action function. That's basically it. And then, so what we mean is that most cells don't do anything exciting electrically. You reach threshold, you fire an action potential. The cells that do that are neurons and, or, and muscle fibers, and that's one or two more, but that's basically it for our purposes, right? So that's just to review stuff. So an excitatory neurotransmitter increases resting membrane potential? Is that what you're saying? It, it moves a cell away from resting membrane potential, right? Okay. Making it more likely to fire. Okay. Inhibitory bits opposite. Yeah. It, it moves it away from the rest of it makes moves it towards the resting membrane potential or below the resting membrane potential sometimes, yeah. makes it less likely to fire. Okay. Yes. Would the um the able to return to basic action with the appropriate inhibitory inhibitors mm -hmm. using the multiplication rules, is that what you're gonna basically try to give us like a math problem and just try No, remember that was the whole thing where you had a circuit like when we did the final circuits, and you have something that's inhibiting something that's inhibitory, mm -hmm. or it's exciting something that's inhibitory that's inhibitory, or like these chain of things that happen, those those things, if you if you follow the math, math the multiplication rules, like if you take plus times plus is plus, and negative times negative is negative, and negative times a negative times a negative is negative, mm -hmm. that's how you determine the output of those. So they're kind of simple to do if you know that rule. But you're just going to give us like I'll give you I'll, I'll, yes I yeah because I don't I'm not going to have you guys draw. A spinal cord diagram, but I might ask you about it, right? So, okay. and you, you might have to figure out, well, is this going to excite or inhibit some muscle? Okay. Right? So. That's why are neurons considered excitatory? If they can change their resting membrane potential and move away from it and fire an action potential, right? So some cells just don't, they just stay at one voltage. These guys move up and down. Can you explain the concept of inhibitory potential? So this is, this is a, it seems a little more complicated than it really is. The whole idea is that um, you, you want to have some sort of information from a cell firing. And there's more than one way to do it. The easiest way is just what's called rate coding. It's basically you have a frequency, and that tells you something about the activity of the cell. The easiest way is it's proportional. In other words, the higher the firing rate of the cell, the more of whatever message is trying to send. So for example, the Golgi tendon organ, if it's firing at low frequencies, that tells you it's experiencing low force. As it starts experiencing more and more force, it fires at higher and higher rates, right, higher frequencies. So, and I think it has what, it started at five hertz, which is five times a second, and then it went up to 200 times a second. As it fires more, it's telling you it's experiencing more force. So that's, that's what we mean by rate coding. Right, and if you and so if you and if you look at the the one eighth the 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 muscle fibers, the muscle spindle fibers, you'll see they do the same thing, right? Yes. You mentioned about the time conversion time. Um. Sure. <laughs> Did it say that? Then? Yeah. So yeah, so yeah, time just means basically it's active all the time. It has a firing rate that's just kind of constant and. Uh, and then, um, so like good example, you have that, that, that um, static stretch receptor. You stretch the muscle, it keeps firing a long time. Whereas the, dy the, um, the dynamic nuclear bag cell, right, when, it, when the 1A fires, it's going to fire once the stretch starts and then stops. So it just fires brief little bursts, and it tells you something's changed. So phasic tells you something has changed. Tonic tells you something is continuous. 
the continuous firing versus first firing, basically. Okay, so this is good. Now we're getting some good stuff. All right, so, all right, let's say that we have an upper motor neuron or the cortex. And it's sending axons down to a motor pool. So this is the, everything that would uh, you know, activate a particular muscle. The motor neurons that are in the spinal cord, are they all the same size? No, right? We have basically small, medium, and large, okay? And so let's, before we think about the firing rate, let's think about these guys a little bit. So each one of these is connected to a motor unit, right? So this and the muscle fibers is connected to. The motor unit. What do you know about that motor unit? That this is the smallest of the motor neurons. What can you tell me about that motor unit? You should be able to tell me quite a bit, actually. It's a small motor neuron. Nah, not you. We just talked about this this afternoon. <laughs> it's a small motor neuron, unless you want to get started. And um, it's the smallest one of them. Uh, it's going to fire first, okay? We'll see that in a second. But as far as the motor unit itself, right, what's, what's, what can you tell me about it? You should be able to tell me the fiber type. Oh, type 1. Type 1, right? So, again, it's type 1, right? And we know that because it's the smallest one, so you know it has, you know, um, slow twitch, it has the least muscle fibers in it. The muscle fibers are small. They have uh, ability to use uh, a lot of uh, ATP production is high. Okay. And then the next one, the next size here, it has more muscle fibers involved in the pool. And they're bigger. This is the type 2As. Right. And this last one, which is the biggest, here, right, has even more muscle fibers involved, right, and they're even larger, so that's the type 2B, okay? So what's going to happen is that we want to, this is going to obey the, the size principle. So this cell should fire before this cell should fire before that cell. And the reason that's going to happen is that it's harder to change the electrical properties to make this cell become positive enough. I should say it's easier to make this cell positive enough to fire an action potential than it is to make this cell positive enough to fire an action potential than it is to make that cell fire an action potential. Because, again, I gave the example of throwing a rock into a pool right, and, and generating waves. That kind of represents action potential. So it's easier to start a wave in a small pool than it is in a large pool. So what that means is if I fire, let's say, at 5 hertz, like five times a second, that might be enough to activate that motor neuron and cause that motor unit to fire. But I might to get, have to get up to 10 hertz to cause this one to fire and 20 hertz to cause that one to fire. Okay? So if I want them all to fire, I have to fire 20 hertz, which means they're all going to fire, right? Because the smallest all the way to the largest. I can generate more force by going up to, like, say, 25 hertz, and then even the small ones will actually generate a little more force, and the mediums will generate more force, and the biggest ones will generate more force. This gives us a good example of using that feed forward model. If I'm going to pick up something that I think is very heavy, I'm going to send down a signal at a very flat high frequency, like 25 hertz, causing, when I'm ready, I'm ready, causing all those muscles to basically fire, right? They'll still be, still be recruited in order, but the order's going to be very quick. I'm going to send down a strong signal. If I think it's going to be light, I'm going to send down a small signal to recruit the smallest motor units. Okay. So is the firing rate in a smaller motor pool higher? Um, no, it just gets activated a small. It basically just gets activated a smaller one. Yeah. So they all basically are going to. The, so basically, you think about you, you cause this one to, to fire at five, right? 
Well, that might mean this one might only fire once or twice, but it's enough to activate these guys. And so there's still some flexibility. If I keep on changing this firing rate, this guy can still fire fire more, and maybe if they get to 30 or 40 hertz, have a stronger influence on these. So, and you know, the same thing is happening from those inner neurons we talked about. So if I have a 1A afferent and I have a little bit of stretch in my muscle, it's gonna send back a weak signal only the smallest motor units are going to actually cause the muscle to contract, or to, uh, yes, to, to uh, relax, or to uh, contract. So when we talk about the stretch reflex, you get the patellar tendon test, that's a really strong stimulus. You're really stretching the muscle. And so in that case, you're sending a strong signal back, and all you're doing by the size principle, you're recruiting all those cells. Most of the time you have a stretch reflex, you're just causing a small change in muscle length. You're sending back a small signal, Recruiting only small motor units. Okay, next. Okay, so that's the idea that um, you have a uh, you you have a, a signal that that's generated in the muscle that goes back and affects its own behavior. So that the good example of that is the muscle spindle. The muscle spindle sends back information that causes that muscle to contract. Right. You could also think the, G, the Golgi tendon organ, the Golgi tendon organ detects sensation in that muscle. It sends back a signal that eventually causes that muscle to relax. So that's what we mean by reciprocal innervation. It's sending back information that affects its own behavior. The, you know, It's uh, sending back some so sensory information from, from a muscle is going back to the spinal cord and activating uh, a mo and affecting the motor neuron that's controlling that muscle essentially. So it's, it's sending back sensory information that controls its own contraction and relaxation state. Is it just going to the spinal cord affecting the motor neuron? Mm -hmm. that, that controls that same muscle. Right, so think so, you know the reciprocal. When we talked about, for example, the stretch reflex, you have something going back and causing the exact same muscle that was stretched to contract. That's reciprocal innervation. You also have uh, information that's going to affect an inner neuron that's causing another muscle to relax. That's not reciprocal innervation. That's because you're affecting a different muscle. So this idea, there's a loop, right, where one muscle sends information back that affects itself. So, just to answer this question, what activates the IA inner neuron? Is it sensory at one particular? Would that be like IA activates the IA? Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. So the way that one worked was. Yeah, so you have the 1A afferent comes back. Activate the motor neuron going to the same muscle, right? That's the that's the monosynaptic reciprocal innervation. It also activates the one a inner neuron, which inhibits a motor neuron going back to this motor neuron. In this case, it's the flexor. So it goes back and inhibits the opposite, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's the 1A. All right, what does the 1B do? It's inhibitory as well, but it inhibits this guy. Yeah, so that's an example of reciprocal innervation where the effect is inhibitory, where you go through a set an inner neuron. Okay, so um, yeah, the inner neurons are pretty much always, no, that's not true, they're not always inhibitory, but they're mostly inhibitory. Yes. Oh, um, mine was the stretch reflex was 
Versus Gary Byron. Gary Sherrington, yeah. So he did a lot of the stuff we talked about. So and we I think he's the only guy we've mentioned by name so far. So yeah, Charles Sherrington. Um, why what, why is he the brand of Um, why is he? <laughs> okay, well, uh, well, first of all, they don't, yeah, so, so first of all, the, you know, if, if you're having a static stretch, you, that's pretty normal, right? You, your muscles are in static contraction all the time and stretched. So you don't want to reflex that causes your muscle to relax if it's in a static stretch. The dynamic stretch is a little bit more concerning. So you can, and you need these two different types of information. So they, they actually, they, they're going to serve different circuits, right? The one B, I should say one A. Is it one B or one A? What do we got there? What's, what's the static and static and dynamic, right? So let's say you got static or dynamic, and two is static. Okay. Um, so why do we have these two systems? Well, this is for unexpected stretch. That's for chronic, which is for constant stretch, which you know happens quite a bit. So anytime we're, huh? Two? No, it's uh, two A two. Oh, okay. Two one B is from the Golgi. So let me put it up here. One B is Golgi. Yeah. Okay. Um, so basically, they have to have so that so one of them is going to be more important for when you're moving and you want to have you know know that what's going on dynamically you might want to make adjustments based on what's going on if you're more stretched than you expect the static you know a lot of times you have static stretch it's not a big deal the other thing is that we tune these separately so these each have different gamma inference gamma motor neurons that control them. No, they're two different systems, right? So this would be the, the gamma efferent, this would be the dynamic gamma efferent, which is the static. Um, so if you think why, why that's necessary, again, the idea is that depending on the circumstance, you might want to know a lot more about static stretches, or you might want to know a lot more about dynamic stretch. So you can tune up things so that you know more about one of those systems or the other, or both if you're really, really concerned. Um, and how does serotonin and um, noradrenaline affect motor neurons? And um, I think I know that one, but the examples are of high and low. I'm not sure what the high and low is. Let's see. It says good examples of high and low. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Mm. Okay. Um, so um, you have a motor neuron. And um, it has some sort of resting membrane potential, okay? And there's also some sort of threshold. And so what this means is there's a certain amount of voltage change that has to be necessary to go from resting membrane potential to the threshold. So what serotonin or norepinephrine do is they raise that resting membrane potential. So what this means is it's easier for that cell to get to the point where it will fire and cause muscle contraction. And it also turns out that it will raise the, the, the 
top firing rate of those cells. So we're, in other words, where it might have been that, you know, if it only took fire 25 hertz, it might be able to go to 35 hertz. So it's easier to fire, and it can fire more strongly because we made the cell more excited, essentially. And so, does that make sense? Oh, okay. Yeah, so here, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so, you, so you're basically just making the cell more excited right, kind of as a baseline. And then when you actually put input into it, then it can react more strongly than it normally would. So like some examples of this, um, let's use a tiger example. You can take chased by a tiger, your adrenal glands release some warp and effort. It's going through your blood, all of a sudden all your muscles are gonna be compelled to fire more quickly than they did previously because they're all like on, on edge, right? They all got this higher excitability, they're ready to go. Less dramatically, with serotonin, for example, right, as you walk around, one of the things that happens is that you kind of spritz a little more serotonin on your postural muscles. So they're just kind of holding you up more than when you're relaxed. When you go to sleep, the, uh, the normal kind of level of serotonin that's put down on your motor neurons kind of goes away. So that's why you're all like a little more like when you're asleep, right? Because you're just basically, all your motor neurons are just have low resting memory potential and it takes a lot for them to come back. So if you were to go to the serotonin input goes down to the temperature? Yeah. Right. Yeah, to, to the motor neurons. So serotonin goes other places too, but for the motor neurons, it basically, so you have a whole little area of your brain that you might have heard of called the reticular formation that kind of sets your basal arousal level. Like arousal is in like how ready you are to do stuff. And part of that is like, well, how active are your motor neurons? When you're asleep, your motor neurons are not aroused. When you're like really worried about something, then they're going to be more aroused, ready to, to spring into action, essentially. What film has so good that you would say that? Okay. Okay, so if you, if you look at, you know, if you look at what we have in the muscle spindle, we have two cell types, nuclear bag cells. These are the ones that have the little pot belly, right? And you got the nuclear chain cells. These three guys make up the static system. So basically you have nuclear chain cells plus what's called a static. Nuclear bag cell. And the other bag cell you have to have left is the dynamic. Nuclear bag cells. Really, so there's that one cell in the muscle spindle organ. There's more than one muscle spindle organ, but this is the cell that has the dynamics. So really, this is the one that has the 1A afferent going away to, from it. So I did post that little, the, the reading up. For, for the book, and so that's from a Candell. It's an upper level book. If I ever had a book for the course, it would be that book, but it's like that big. Um, they have a nice illustration of this whole system. So it's for you to check out. That's actually where I got the picture from the last one for the, for the slide. So it's a good place to explore. So let's stay here since I took the time to draw this out. Does anybody have, have any other questions about this system? If I if you have to label anything, it would be this, right? So the other thing, so I can think of, I would have this out here. You'd have to label some stuff. I could have a simple spinal cord um, reflex where you might have to tell me if this is the one A or the one B afferent. You should be able to do that, All right? If I showed you something and I said this is this muscle's relaxing, this one's contracting, you should be able to tell me if it's a stretch reflex or if it's the one that involves Golgi tendon organ, and you should be able to tell me, you know, if this is a 1A or 1B afferent. So 
It's going to be no such short. It's more so short answer. It's really hard to be a multiple choice because otherwise I won't know. You know, like how much. You know, yeah, yeah. True false. True false. Yeah. False. You don't do true. You don't do that anymore. You just give up on. It just says like know the following. Yeah. Well, there will be, if I'm saying, if there's a good chance, I'll do a picture of that. I'm not going to make you draw that for me. No, not draw it, but like, will you be like, what is this, and what is this function? So well, I mean, is the nuclear back cells right now? I don't know why we had to have two, but we, I do, I mean, that, so the, the weird thing is, this makes sense. The dynamic back cell has a set function, right? Why the set with the static back cell adds nuclear chain cells, I'm not like, quite sure, but... It does, right? It probably has to do with something when you tighten these up separately, and this probably gets slightly different mechanical information than that based on its structure, but I'm not sure exactly why. So you would have to say, well, this, this, the, the dynamic chip bag cell does this, right? Sends back information through 1A afferents, and that helps you do what? You know, like really detect stretch that's sudden, which underlies the stretch reflex. These guys collectively let you see constant stretch in a muscle, which tells you what? Well, it's mostly about body position, right? You know that your muscle stretch in a certain way that tells you about its length. And that you need that for proprioception. It's not gonna really necessarily underwrite or underlie a reflex, but that information does go back to your cortex and you know, oh, what's it? My arm's over here. So, so the static bag cell and the static chain cell? Yes, they work together. They're part of the same static system. Okay. Uh, spinal shock was in. They showed you that little weird movie, right? Uh, with the weird piano. So the idea is that uh, if somebody gets their spinal cord cut in humans, what they do is they have a period of several weeks in which they have no spinal reflexes. Right? And that's the reflex they were trying to show is really basic. Um, and so, you know, that's a really basic spinal reflex, so you don't have that for several weeks. And then, what will happen, eventually the reflexes will come back. So sometimes it'll be overly dramatic reflexes. It'll be hyper reflexes, but they'll come back. So what that really tells you is that the cortex is really necessary for normal reflex function. It's really heavily influenced by what the cortex is telling you to do. And cats, Spinal shock lasts for a few hours. Right? So the, basically, there. In other words, there's still supportive lymph input that's necessary for for reflexes most of the time, but those reflexes can reassert themselves within a few hours. So it tells you that you know humans human spinal reflexes are much more influenced by cortex than. And if you go backwards, like you know, monkeys take a few weeks to recover, and then you got dogs that take a week, and you got you know. As, you go, as, you, as animals become simpler, then spinal shock becomes less significant. Okay, so they're activated by mechanoreceptors. They have mechanoreceptors, so that's why they're firing an action potential out here that's heading back towards the spinal cord. Remember, they're, they're sensory neurons, so they, they're firing an action potential here that's heading back towards the spinal cord. The mechanoreceptors, so what does that mean? It means that the channel is somehow gated or opened up by mechanical stress. So either the, you know, they're wrapped around these cells that are getting stretched the muscle stem cells are getting stretched, or the Golgi chain cells that, you know, as you stretch, they're getting pinched by collagen fibers, and that's causing them to collapse. Again, those are kind of odd channels. You know, they're a little harder to understand. Yeah. Is there lasting listening? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, there's stuff where they actually isolate the cell and they get like a little teeny uh, glass electrode and they actually like poke at the cell <laughs> yeah, and see what happens. It's hard to do. That's part of the problem. Um, I've seen some papers on it. I can look around, but yeah, there's some that are doing them. It's just, it's basically really just kind of really hard electrophysiology, right? So, um, but the other thing you can think of is they've got to be connected to cytoskeletal elements. They've got to be connected to exoplanet matrix in some cases. So you could also play around with, well, what are those connections? And if I make a mutant that doesn't have that, what happens to that? Some of those things. Like, so. Well, it's a able to describe quantum patterns in the Okay, so what's so that's the there's a slide that I had where it had like some force and it had a muscle and then it got stretched and then it found a ring stretch. So basically, if you start stretching a muscle suddenly, like if I move this and this, this muscle is going to get stretched, right? And um, stretched like this, right? Um, I move backward and as I'm stretching the muscle, then the one A retracts. As soon as I kind of stop stretching it, stuck in this position. They don't care, right? They're worried about dynamic change. And there's no dynamic change happening there. The static ones are still firing, sending back information about how long the muscle is. So, and then if I relax it, it turns out the dynamic ones fire again. So they also respond to both and change again, but then once the muscle is relaxed, they both fire. Relaxed, considering the aspects of the right yeah so again that's the old, the old idea of what they did and then people start realizing that they're activated in the very forces they just, need to they just take muscle tension right so they're all over your hands for example so when you're doing very fine motor tasks they're actually sending information about force so people are very delicate stuff so um, <clears throat> now the, the problem is that those one B inner neurons that we talked about which receive information from the GTOs they also get input from a lot of other areas that um, if you did encounter a lot of mechanical stress would probably make them fire more strong, right? So we talked about cutaneous receptors, joint receptors, pain, pain receptors, things like that. Also go back to 1Bs. So, but the GTOs themselves probably don't really tell you much about the influence of force. Do you think they Well, they go up, I mean, they're not, in other words, um, they go up a lot, but there's going to be some point where they reach a, a threshold they can't fire anymore. I don't think that's necessarily due to nature of stress. Right? So in other words, let's say you have a muscle that can uh, handle a thousand newtons, and this cell pops out at 500 newtons, or you know, you know five pops out at a thousand newtons. It doesn't really tell you anything beyond you know now that there's damage. But if you start going beyond that, 1100 newtons, then you start getting mechanical receptors in your joints that are actually starting to say this is not so great. Pain receptors are saying this is not so great. There's a free nerve endings example in your muscles that detect pain. So they detect tissue damage and they're like, holy shit, that's bad enough. Alright, so can you explain the divergence of the reaction? Yeah, so this is um come back over here. So this is the idea that you're not just affecting